Welcome everybody for the next talk, When Algorithms Fail in Our Personal Lives. It is a one hour talk. Our lovely speaker with us today is Caroline Sinders. She's a user researcher for IBM. She's also an artist, a researcher and a video game designer. She's from the States. And I should also mention that she is a member of the NYC Resistor Hackerspace. And, oh, I see some fans over here, cool. <laughs> Um, we already learned in a bunch of talks over the course of Congress what algorithms do when they fail. Uh, yesterday we learned about how algorithms can discriminate or not discriminate in the hiring process. And Caroline is going to tell us a little more about um, when it's better not use algorithms because there are some things that algorithms just can't do that humans can do. So please give it up for Caroline and enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Caroline Sanders. Uh, I should probably first specify that I am speaking here of my own accord and not on behalf of IBM. So, <laughs> just FYI. Um, and that this is actually a presentation also on a very strange and specific art project I did uh, back in late November. So, when algorithms fail in our personal lives, this is probably the best way to describe me because I live on the internet. Um, I've spent the past two years studying online fandoms, communities, internet culture, and online harassment. Um, and this is what I do for fun outside of work. Um, I think a lot about language and conversation as identifiers, and I spend a lot of time reading the way in which conversations unfold on different subreddits, on Reddit, 4chan, 8chan, Wikipedia, the way Wikipedia is used as a conversational tool, not just to upload information, and then obviously Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Um, and the one thing I've sort of learned from all this is that each of these different platforms have a very different identity, and they have a very different way in which conversation sort of has evolved linguistically to that platform. The way we talk on Reddit is a lot different than the way we talk on Twitter, and I think that that is due to the infrastructural design of the platform itself as well as the ways in which the platform identifies itself to users, so like a code of conduct. Um, two years ago, I, or yeah, actually like a year and a half ago, I really started focusing on online harassment. I specifically focused on Gamergate. Uh, as a video game designer, I saw Gamergate sort of affecting the community around me. I didn't necessarily, I'm not driven to study harassment by why it happens, but rather how. How does harassment unfold on different sort of sorts of platforms? And how do platforms allow for different kinds of communication? And really, how open is the general user on a platform? How connected are they to the privacy policies? And how aware are they of how exposed they are and how permeable their data and information is? So TLDR, I explore complex emotions and emotional reactions within systems. Um, and I'm going to briefly cover some of the uh, anti-harassment research I've done. So sometimes I write things, the internet doesn't like them. Uh, last April, the internet sent a SWAT team to my mom's house. If you don't know what swatting is, it's a very popular online harassment tactic that manifests itself, IRL. Um, oftentimes, a fake, violent phone call is placed to a local police department. That violent phone call triggers the militarized police to be deployed, and this is what happened to my mom. Sometimes panels I'm on get canceled because maybe they're kind of controversial. Um, I submitted a design panel to South by Southwest and it was canceled due to harassment and threats of violence. So I guess my work seems kind of contentious. I think that it's pretty straightforward. It's generally design. Um, I don't know why anyone would have a really massive opinion around it. But the thing I sort of want to talk about actually is, and what I care about exploring is, how do systems affect behavior? So I said earlier, I'm here not as an IBM representative. But um, I spend most of my day job actually at working on Watson, working in artificial intelligence as a user researcher around conversational analytics for chat robots. And that's kind of a mouthful. So what I mean by that is I spend a lot of time working with software that allows users to set up chat robots. So I think a lot about the ways in which I'm designing software to help people design conversations that robots have with people. So when I say I believe that systems affect behavior, I live that every day. And I think about the ways in which the structure of an interface actually will lead people to, to converse and what that would look like. So in the past two years of doing just, I guess, broad uh, heuristic ethnographic research, what I've come to realize is users have a myriad of different problems that can be solved in similar ways but yield radically different results, meaning that we can sort of start approaching ways to solve problems of harassment through uh, 
either new kinds of algorithms or a really flexible UI on top of an algorithm, i.e., what if we gave people more robust privacy settings and allowed users to start to articulate the ways in which they're reachable and how their data, really their conversations are read. Um, and I think this because algorithms really aren't that smart and language within an algorithm is a, it's decontextualized into data. We as, oh sorry, <laughs> we as users, we provide context to language. language. Language is what we make it, but in a system it's not, it's simply just bits of data. Um, so I was driven by this thought, how can I make a flexible system to solve a variety of different problems for a variety of different people? So I, I did what I do best and I made a low res wireframe. And I created these sort of speculative wireframes to sort of focus myself on what I thought could be achievable and then I decided to test it against 20 different users I had interviewed that had been affected by Gamergate as well as a handful of, of Gamergaters themselves who would interact with me on Twitter and I would ask them questions about the ways in which they um, organize themselves, the ways in which they talk to other people, what conversations they were hoping to get out of interacting with me on Twitter. Um, and what I sort of started to learn is that we need to focus on privacy and social media and it needs to be as uh, prevalent and as important as writing content itself. So do you see that gray box at the top? That is a placeholder for a button that sends you to a redesigned privacy page. So from interviewing these 20 users, I got a really uh, robust sense of different kinds of needs and wants users wanted out of Twitter. I interviewed people that had over 100,000 followers that absolutely wanted to remain completely public and they wanted to be reachable at all times. I interviewed some users that had 3,000 followers that wanted to be completely hidden but still have their tweets treated as media, thus shareable. And I interviewed some users that wanted to not go private, which is a very public statement on Twitter to have the lock next to you, but wanted to have all the affordances of privacy. So what I've added, as you can see, is allow these check marks to allow a user to start to change the way in which their written content can be uh, accessed and sort of really actually change the way in which the amount of users on Twitter could start to read content they're posting. So one of them is uh, allow uh, followers of your followers to tweet at you, so the idea of friends of friends. Um, do not allow accounts less than X with, uh, uh, do not allow accounts with less than X followers to follow you or don't allow accounts with less, uh, less than X days. Meaning uh, new accounts were often created in moments of harassment campaigns, so if an account was a week old with two followers, that's probably a troll account. And additionally, it also allows users to sort of say like, oh, if you know, you're not on my level, you can't tweet at me. Not judging, that's an interaction someone wanted. Um, and then I sort of started to think more about what, what does it mean to exist publicly as a person on a platform Twitter is sort of this mixed identity and mixed emotional state. It's both professional and personal. It's used as a networking tool as well as a social aid and a communicative tool. So people either have really persistent aliases or avatars that, they've, that have followed them from platform to platform but they're not using their real name. There's levels of pseudo anonymity on Twitter. In my case, I use my real name and I can't really undo that. Um, so my needs in using Twitter, especially as a technologist, exists in a much different way than per se someone who uses it as a casual medium. And we have very different needs. But through these different kinds of dials, I feel that this serves my needs as well as all the users I've interviewed because we're able to start to tailor through UI and sort of be able to pull from very like top level information just mainly around followers as to how accessible I am. Uh, I had other things such as blocked accounts and blocked tweets. Right now you can only see uh, blocked accounts, you can't see blocked tweets. What if you could? And I pull from this because within moments of harassment, it, even if it's a sustained stalker, there's often a tweet that will trigger it. It's never going to someone's account, um, at least within a harassment campaigns. You're not really going to someone's account and saying, today I'm blocking you. There is often an interaction, a tweet that will trigger that response. So what if you could see that, start to group them together, and maybe send a report to Twitter or to yourself, and sort of you can, the user could start to contextualize, this is a way in which um, these tweets are linked. So if there's mob harassment campaign, a user could say, I think all these are linked. And if Twitter is implementing any kind of mas machine learning or natural language processing, they'd be able to start batching multiple reports at once and see how they're all related. Again, what if you could group mentions together? Um, and I added this last night. One thing that I sort of noticed from a lot of my research is that users don't really have an understanding as to how uh, how their language is actually data and how accessible their things are. So I'm sure you've heard a variety of stories around tweets going viral. 
someone tweets something and then months later it's dug up or they tweet something. In the case of this really uh, well-known incident, this woman tweeted a really off-color joke about AIDS, got on a plane, 12 hours later, this tweet had completely exploded. The background of that story is that this woman only had 100 followers and uh, had never had her tweets interacted with like very much at all, not, well, not in the sense of a stranger. So for her, this was a complete moment of the system kind of breaking. And I, I wonder if there were ways to sort of start to articulate to users how accessible you are. Even if you feel small, even if you feel like uh, no one is interacting with your tweets, you're still actually completely open. And the information you send out into the system is media that can be isolated and shared quickly. And that's sort of the way in which um, Twitter functions. Additionally, so anyway, so I wondered, like, what if you could just break something down really simply and just sort of say, follower impressions and non-follower impressions sort of get an idea as to who's interacting with your tweet and who outside of your perceived social, your, your decentralized social circle on Twitter. And then I started looking at Facebook. Um, and one thing I also sort of learned from, additionally, I did another round of interviews uh, specifically for this project I'm getting into, Social Media Breakup Coordinator, where users actually had no idea what the privacy checkup meant. So I think this is a great addition. You add a button. Um, you can say only friends can see this. But what if Twitter added like a pop-up and then said, great, this content right here, this comment, if your friend Jane comments on it, her mom can see it. And sort of start to really show like how extended networks that you're unconnected to, uh, second and third, second and third party relationships can actually interact with your, your information. So I'm really driven by this need and this idea as a designer what would it look like to have a semi-private space in a public network? And how, how could I design that? And I think about this a lot because our, our, our communication on the internet is asynchronous, right? But a lot of uh, social media creates things as a timeline. This creates a false idea as to how information is actually accessed and how data is actually stored. And that false information is articulated to users. So what feels like safer spaces, even if you're completely public because you're not interacted with, is actually a lie. It's a false sense of information. It's a false sense of safety. So I wonder with all these varying um, levels of needs that we have as users, and as we live more and more of our lives digitally and, to, and on social media, what would it look like to design a semi-private space in a public network? Um, and so like the past few years have really hit this on home that there's this nebulousness surrounding algorithms and social media and the way in which our data is saved. And a lot of that happens when Facebook, for instance, changed their timeline to sort of be algorithmically driven based off content. Uh, then I think it was last summer, there was this thing called the Ice, Buck, Ice Bucket Challenge, or two summers ago, and these riots in Ferguson, Missouri. And sort of what happened, people realized, is that Ice, Buck challenge, Ice Bucket Challenge posts were being weighted above these other protests. And uh, the way to work around that was to include Ice Bucket Challenge when you were posting about Ferguson to sort of start to flip and change what you were seeing algorithmically in your timeline. So there's this kind of idea that you, users don't quite know what and why the algorithm will weight things over other things. So when you post something on Facebook, the feedback is, I have no idea when it's accessible, how it's accessible, and if it will be accessed. So that led me to this project <laughs> that I created. Um, I created a fake performance art piece. I mean, it's a real art piece called Social Media Breakup Coordinator where I turned a video game art gallery in New York called Baby Castles into a doctor's office. And I held 15 minute therapy consulting sessions on social media. I had users fill out a 22 point, very standard user quiz around why they were showing up. Um, but then when they sat with me, I had them sign a terms of service agreement. Uh, I listened to them and then I started to write down notes. But before I started this project, I reached out to a variety of different people because I was sort of, from my research, I sort of started to realize that there's a lot of different moments where there needs to be human intervention within algorithms, within social media. So how do you start to un, how do you start to pull away from different groups that you've been associated with? How do you start to cut ties? And how do you start to cut ties between information when you cross post against different platforms? So a good example of that is what happens if um, someone in your family dies and that ends up in Facebook memories because you Instagrammed it. What does that feel like to have that emotional trigger? What does it feel like to quit a job and not, and not be sure, like, 
if your new coworkers can see your old coworkers, or if you post something negative about your old job, are you still connected to your boss and what can they see? And generally there's this lack of understanding that I found that most general users, probably not most people in this room, have a lack of understanding around how much their information is accessed. So I was curious on a, on a bunch of levels if, if people would actually pay me to give them advice, if they would trust me as a professional, and if they would actually engage with my services. And then I was curious if I could actually then covertly sort of teach them the privacy policies of all the different platforms they were on. Um, so when I started this project, I realized I need to talk to a variety of different professionals. I'm a user researcher, and so my profession lies in talking to users and designing solutions for them. But as social media starts to overtake more and more aspects of our lives, I realize that there are certain things that I'm not equipped to handle. So what happens if someone has suffered trauma on social media? As a victim of harassment, I still can't offer anyone feedback on that, and that's sort of not my place. So I spoke to a rape crisis counselor, an engineer, a data scientist and professor, and a private therapist and a private psychiatrist. And the takeaway I got was mainly this, and this is something I'd love to impart on most social media. Uh, engineers and designers is, it's not my job to necessarily tell people what to do, it's my job to listen to what people need to get done. So an example from that is, let's say a, a user came to me for social media breakup coordinator and said, I have an abusive boyfriend and he's horrible and we have a child together and I want to unfacebook Facebook friend him. It's not my place to necessarily say, okay, wait, like, can I know more? Like, are you close to this family? Like, let's start to cut down all these ties. And the reason I would ask that is, thinking as a designer, um, if you're Facebook friends with someone, and then you're Facebook friends with their parents, and then it says on that person's like, profile who their family is, the system has created more ties to that person, even regardless of if you unfriend them, you'd need to block them, as well as unfollow all of these other people related to them and tied to their profile that, to actually really separate. Um, and a lot of the feedback I got was, it's not necessarily your job to, let, to tell a user all of that if they're telling you what exactly they need. You sort of need to listen and guide from there and not really get into, well, why are you here? What are all these different, really specific and highly personal details? So why would I do this? <laughs> um, I was just very interested in the ways in which people live their lives online, and I really wanted to see if I could also gather a lot of data from this project. I had 16 people fill out 22 different questions and meet with me and walk through all their different problems. And I was really curious if I could provide solutions the way an algorithm would. I outlined 10 different solutions that I could affix to people based off different questions that they answered in a certain order. Um, and again, the covert uh, point of this project was to sort of teach people about the permeability of their posts and really how privacy is looked at and interacted with on social networks. Um, and with the onset of all these different apps, particularly in America, that um, are offering to outsource emotional labor to a person, meaning there's all these new apps that have been created of, we'll break up with your boyfriend for you. I was really sort of curious to see if people would actually engage with me face to face. Um, so when I launched the project, people thought it was real. Um, and then the media thought it was real. <laughs> and this was really, it was really hard to explain to, for instance, Jezebel, that this was an art project. Because they were like, but you're charging people and you made them sign a contract. Is the contract legally binding? Yes, it is. So you charge the money? I did. Did you give them fake feedback? No, the feedback was all sincere. I really legitimately tried to help solve these problems. But it's an art project. And the reason it's an art project is to me it's a, a massive comment on the sharing economy that's in America. And just this idea that I could be an emotional mechanical Turk and I completely made that by design and intention. Should people be trusting me with their data? Yes, because I am a professional and I made sure to very very clearly articulate the ways in which I would use their data, how they would be protected, and that I would not share any personal information about them. I went through all of those steps, but is that sort of the like, negotiation we have with social networks? Do we have that kind of interfacing? Um, and also the, a bit, an even bigger comment was no one ever commented on price. Uh, I charged $1 a minute and to sort of sit and listen all day 
to people. I only gave them 15 minute blocks. It was actually incredibly taxing physically. Um, it was an all day event where I think I only had, yeah, I gave myself like 15 minutes for lunch. I definitely have a whole new type of uh, respect for therapists. That's, that was grueling. So I started to break down before I started the project as to what platforms I would cover. Uh, these are examples of my post-it notes I had covered Resistor in one evening. And I started to break things down based off the four major platforms that are used in America, which is LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I started to break down by what I thought were the four most broad, but most universal uh, social groupings. So, uh, friends, family, work, and romantic. And then I started to sort of think about why your romantic partner would friend you on LinkedIn, for example, or why they would follow you on Instagram, or why your boss would friend you on all of those platforms. And I started to attach different emotional responses. So should you LinkedIn connect with your dad? Maybe. Should you LinkedIn connect with your lover if you want to? But you don't have to, but then the, these are connections if they're different party apps that you don't really use, like that you then have to break down later if those, if those relationships sour. So remember when I said everyone thought that this project was real? It's because I went through really great pains to also make it look real. So when people showed up, we had a receptionist who had coffee, there was a waiting room, and I had people sign in with the date they arrived, uh, the reason, and I think even the time, and the time of their appointment. Um, there was then a paper version of the quiz if someone walked in. You know, sometimes you get walk-ins, the doctor gets that all the time. This is me working, this is what my desk looked like. Everyone got their own folder that I would write their name on. I would write out what I called a, a receipt. So it's all the advice I'm giving them and then I'm taking my own notes. We both got a copy of the terms of service agreement um, and then I would send them on their way. So it looked actually fairly, it looked hackery legit, you know? I'm in a falling apart building but I'm giving you legitimate advice and you just paid me $15. This is our receptionist, Lauren. <laughs> this is the waiting room. Um, this actually wasn't posed. I like popped my head out and saw a bunch of people sitting and reading. <laughs> this is me providing advice. And these are some students of mine that showed up. Uh, I taught a class on uh, visual storytelling and social media and they had showed up to observe. So then this is also what the breakdown of the terms of service agreement looked like. This is the first page. It's pretty standard. Um, one of my favorite lines is, my observations of this person's behavior and responses gives me no reason to believe that this person is not fully competent to give conformed knowing and willing consent. Um, I should also clarify, a really dear friend of mine who's my collaborator, Fred Jennings, works for um, a law company called Tor Eklund. They do a lot of digital law cases. So he actually drafted this up specifically for me for the needs of this project. I told him to keep it short, and I told him to bold certain things so users could really sort of see if they were scanning like, what I'm talking about. So as you'll see, uh, various social media platforms are emboldened with, like, what I'm, with what I'm giving. But then I had him outline the nature of services. And what you'll see is that um, the client acknowledges the coordinator, the coordinator provides neither content or materials included, such as financial advice, counseling, or therapy. And I really wanted to highlight I am not a therapist, and this is not a therapy session. If anything, I'm like a really weird SEO advisor that you've consulted to maybe talk about your personal life with. But I am definitely not a therapist. And what's funny is that I actually had, so I had 12 people fill this out online, four people do walk-ins. Um, and what's fascinating is I only had two people show up and talk to me about heartbreak. Um, this, this project was not inspired by a breakup. It's actually about breaking up with social media. Um, I had someone show up and ask me a lot of really specific questions about LinkedIn and her workplace and what's the proper way to like break up on LinkedIn with your old job. And I was like, you should just probably unfollow them. I'm like, do you talk to them on Facebook? She's like, I do. I'm like, well, don't do that. Um, and I sort of started to gather all this really fascinating information, specifically around the ways in which my users were using social media. And this is something I actually, I'm going to openly uh, share, probably post this talk if y'all want to look at what I'm accruing. But different things like, you know, let's get a little personal. Why are you here? Romantic reason, work reason, friend, family, general social media. 
And maybe these questions seem really innocuous, but in the sense of way I, the way in which I was structuring my personal algorithm I had built, each of these questions triggered a different kind of answer that I could give someone. And I could string answers together. So I could give a combination of answer A plus answer D plus answer J to sort of give someone a highly personalized um, response to what they had given me, but this is sort of the way algorithms work. It's not highly personalized. The combination to the user just feels personalized. And on my end, that was sort of the art project for myself. And I asked a general question, do you feel safe online? Um, I was uh, slightly surprised only two people said no, but I was more surprised that actually only two people said no. Um, I thought it would be less, and then at times I thought it would be more. Given my research in online harassment, I was prepared for someone to show up and sort of say like, oh, I'm being victimized of harassment, and I had a whole different answer ready for them. But just the fact that most people had come with very general problems, I was actually surprised that in general, 16% of um, applicants don't feel safe online. So when I asked how often do you use social media, pretty much every day, how often do you want to be using it, pretty much every day. And then what I found the most fascinating was um, when people described what they used it for. And so people, about half, half of users said they, they used it for socializing. And when I asked what do you want to use it for, they, half of users replied with networking. So there's a sort of pull to actually be taken off social media. Um, and this is what I learned from all of this. A lot of advice I gave people was maybe you should just quit Facebook, and that was met with a resounding no. How dare you suggest that? And I was like, okay, great, let's pull back. Let me offer something else. Do you have a smartphone? Of course. Delete the app from your phone? They're like, oh, that's brilliant. I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, but the one thing I actually found the most fascinating was most people did not understand Facebook's privacy checkups. So whenever people talked about that they wanted to socialize less and be less accessible, the first thing I always said was, well, what, what, what is your privacy checkup? Like, have you done one? They're like, oh my god, what's that? And I'm like, well, we have a problem. <laughs> um, and the one thing I actually found super fascinating is that most users didn't realize, and this is actually hyper-specific to one user that came through, but most users didn't realize that um, you are accessible even with very private settings on Facebook to nine Facebook friends chat messaging you. And if you respond to that message, that chat is moved into your general stream of chats and it makes your information accessible to that person you have not friended. So I had a friend who was like, well, I want to be super private. The reason I keep my Facebook open is like, what if a young game developer is trying to reach me? And I was like, Do you, did you know that that chat does this? He's like, oh, I had no idea. And I was like, well, that's terrifying, but you could maybe use it this way if you're not concerned about harassment, but you're concerned about being reached. Because um, he was more concerned that friends could be exposed through his openness, which I was like, that's a very, very considerate kind of liberal way to sort of take your Facebook. Um, one thing I learned is that no one knew anything about Instagram's privacy policies, nor did they care. They're like, no, Instagram's fine. It's, we don't care. Um, Again, most people wanted to use social media as a networking tool. But the biggest takeaway was every single person that showed up, and I had a variety of people that were um, incredibly savvy, they were engineers, they actually thought that they did not understand social media as well as they could, and that they needed someone to help them better understand. And they needed someone to help them better understand who they paid $15 to in a hacker video game space. But, and I want that to sort of resonate because that is a joke, but also really think about the fact that like, these tools are so nebulous that you would go to a space and pay someone $15 that you've never met before that says they're an expert to just handle this for you. And that for me was the, sort of the biggest takeaway. How, how can we make things feel more accessible? Or better yet, how do we, let's, like, let's make a new platform. I'm putting this up here because this is one of my biggest pet peeves. You would probably never explain how to SMS someone through screenshots. You'd probably say, oh, do you see that little thing on your phone, right, the chat? Open it up, write in a number, say something. So I, when this project launched, a friend wrote about me and some, and some work I had been doing. And one of her followers legitimately believed that I did not understand Facebook. And he took it upon himself to try to explain Facebook to me. 
which other than being kind of insulting because I work for a tech company and I have a master's in interactive technology, um, what I found illuminating is the fact that this is not a weird response. This is not unusual for someone to say, oh, right, Facebook is so hard to use when it comes to privacy and like creating lists to post to people that I'm going to screenshot everything for you. And that is never the way in which you, you should explain a communication tool to someone. If you have to screenshot something to someone, you fucked up as a designer. <laughs> And those are my general thoughts on that. <laughs> I can't even, I just can't. So I guess what I impart to you and all of us here is, let's make something not shitty. And I know the reason people use Facebook, and this is not a talk to get off Facebook. I use Facebook. Facebook will persist for a very long time. Think of all the third-party apps that use Facebook as an automatic login. That is a design pattern that reinforces the need of Facebook in everyday users' lives. But as a, as a designer and technologist, I want to make something better, even if it's just for my friends. We could do social media.onion. Thoughts? <laughs> And that's sort of where the future of this project comes in, is I'm actually working on a social media co-op with two technologists in New York, Dan Pfeiffer and Max Fenton. I'm doing another round of social media breakup coordinator in Oakland in January. And I'm hoping to keep gathering data around the ways users use these platforms through my performance art piece, but also as well as covertly, you know, keep departing information on privacy and what it would be like if we lived our lives just a little less online. And I'm hoping to sort of eventually have a really robust data set that could be used as an actual data set and not as just a sampling. Thanks. Well, thanks for this inspiring talk, Caroline. If you have questions, please move to the microphones that are dispersed through the room, and then you can ask your question. And we have the first person at microphone number two. Ask away. Uh, yeah. Did you ever raise the question why those people didn't understand the settings on Facebook, etc., and still used it? I mean, it's like walking into a gun shop, uh, purchasing a firearm, and you have no idea what to do with it. Right. I think, so um, what I said sort of like later in the presentation is we have these design patterns in everyday life that really actually uh, enforce this use of Facebook. So um, this project was really sort of centered around general users uh, and a general understanding of technology. We are moving to a very highly digitally literate and data literate society, but we're not there yet. There's pockets of literacy. This is a really good pocket of literacy right here. We're a really awesome community. But um, one thing I sort of strive is like the people that are misusing or misunderstanding Facebook, they're not... Um, like elderly parents. They're actual cohorts of mine that are my age, people younger and people even a few years older. And I think the reason is that Facebook is really easy and it's highly addicting to use. And it's, it's like a phone book, everyone's there. It stores birthdays for you, which is really actually helpful. Um, it's, a, a, it's a fast way to talk to people. But I think the bigger thing is too, is that it's enforced on other sites. So think of all the websites you go to during a day. And how many of them say, log in with Facebook, sign up with Facebook, like log in with Twitter. And those design patterns, which seem really innocuous to us, actually are really important. They further enforce the, um, the, the ubiquity of Facebook because it makes it easy. So then, I mean, I'm shuddering thinking about all the third party apps that would be associated right now with a Facebook login if you've done that for every site. But the common user does not know that. And that's sort of the issue, I think. All right, next question from mic number four, please. Hi, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, I have basically two questions that kind of are the same, and they are around the art project part of your talk. And the first one is, um, how did you make sure that um, people would actually understand that this was a, a piece of performance art? Did you rely on the absurdity of your proposition that that, that would be recognized? Because clearly people thought not, and like in terms of satire, there needs to be some um, element of exaggeration or something that makes it clear that this isn't intend this is intended as a piece of art. So I was just wondering what right. your thought was that. And the second part was where do you, um, um, so the data that you get from your 
piece of art you presented as a research outcome almost. So that obfuscates the kind of um, art, artsiness of your project and turns it into real life data. And isn't that also one of the problems why people are so careless with uh, Instagram because they see it as art when they photograph their food, whether that's true or not is uh, right. like open to debate, but they don't see it as an actual act of data collection. So, yeah. Right. So I guess to sort of back up, um, the, way in which I de de the way in which I sort of describe myself uh, as a speculative designer, and I think about critical design a lot and critical making and like what is that line? And oftentimes you're making something real um, that is sort of making a point. And the way in which I explain, like most people seem to sort of get that this was an art project of mine. Um, and it helped that I was in New York doing this and I was doing it in an art gallery that's a video game gallery. So there were arcades in the back of the space. Um, but certain people I actually realized, because I, I had a couple people phone in that had sort of seen this and signed up online and were not in New York. And I realized that they didn't know that this was an art piece. And I kind of went with it. Um, and a lot of that is they were signing a service of service agreement. I was, I did tell them like this is not therapeutic advice. I'm not held liable for any decisions that you make. And I said all that over the phone to make sure that they understood that. And then I told them these are just suggestions and you don't have to follow them and you are allowed to push back. And that's what I tell every, every participant is I'm giving you these suggestions based off my best practice knowledge and this algorithm I've designed that you don't get to see. So your questions are triggering certain results, but you are also allowed to say I don't like that and then I can tailor them slightly. If you don't like the result at all, you should take the quiz again. Um, but the bigger thing is that it walks this really weird line and this is a weird anecdote, but I'm, I'm also a portrait photographer. My background is actually in fine art photography and I got a master's in interactive technology years later. And my work is always it was my family and I recreating moments post Hurricane Katrina. So people always ask, oh, are these real photographs, Caroline? Well, they weren't taken on the fly. I set them up, but they were real to me, and they're saying something. And that's the way in which I would describe this project. It's not real, but it was real to us in the moment, and it's commenting on things and also providing a real solution. Thank you. All right, next question from mic number three, please. Do you know of some software that shows how open you are to other people? For example, a Facebook app or something that yeah, shows you a mirror of yourself, more or less? I don't know of any sort of checker like that. I use a variety of different things. A friend of mine made a really great Wi-Fi sniffer, um, which is like at the extreme end of what you're talking about. Um, I generally... I, not that you all should do this, I often will unfollow and refollow and unfriend and refriend people and change my privacy settings and then I try to log out and get someone else to log in, see if they'll let me audit and then I will see what I look like to other people. That's a level of insanity that I don't think most people in this room should necessarily engage with. But I don't actually know of a checker that lets you sort of see that. I know that there are analytic systems you can download for say, per se with Instagram to see like who's unfollowed you and followed you and who's following you that follows other people that you know, which currently Instagram does not have that analytic feedback for users. It's a third party app you have to download. Um, Twitter has started to add analytics on the side to sort of give a, an idea of how accessible your tweets were, but they'll never say like this is who didn't follow you that accessed this tweet today. But they give you a, a, a more robust analytic breakdown of your tweet about puppy dogs did really well, but your tweet about OPSEC did not. All right, Mac number four, please. Hi. Um, I really appreciate uh, your insights on visual design and the user experience of data at rest. Um, I'm really curious what your thoughts are on temporal design and the user experience of data in motion. You know, because you mentioned uh, that one of the, the, the things that came out of your interviews was um, you know, people having a sense uh, of just sort of not understanding social media and feeling like they need help understanding social media. Um, you know, in programming, we talk about code smells, which are sort of features of, you know, code and how people use code that are a sign that something's probably not designed right here. Right. And it seems to me that, you know, that sense of misunderstanding is, is, is a design smell. Maybe that, that there's just too much trying to, co trying to consume users' attention and, you know, 
we need to change the rate at which we're delivering it. Anyway, that's it's, a, it's an open-ended right. question. I'm just really curious what your thoughts are there. So I've actually thought about that a lot. Um, I actually haven't met with any engineers at Facebook or Twitter, but if you're here, I'd love to talk to you. Um, but I met with someone that worked in branding at Twitter, and I asked him to just sort of talk about his day job and describe how the branding team targeted ads, because I figured that was a really good way to get a sense of how the algorithm was working. He started spouting a lot of buzzwords, as he is prone and want to do, because um, he was a coworker of mine from a really old job. But he said something that was really fascinating to me, where he's like, well, you know, Caroline, there's just so much noise. And he's like, you know, we have all these different algorithms working. He's like, but it's just so much noise on top of each other. And you're just trying to find this little signal. So I know, for instance, with Twitter, it's exactly that problem that they infrastructurally design themselves incorrectly. And, and to combat it, you can't, they're at a point where I feel like they cannot shut it down and rebuild it and become minimal, like with a better working code base. So they're building on top of everything. And the reason I also think that, too, is a lot of anti-harassment initiatives that they have, they've been rolling out for verified users and not for the common user base. So if you're a verified user, um, what the way in which their anti-harassment initiatives work, it works way different and way better for you. So they have an algorithm working where um, you will never see as a verified user certain um, harassment tweets. They're catching them before they come to you, and you can look at them later. But there's all these really highly specific uh, changes, and I have not yet seen a verified user account. Um, no one's let me log into theirs. Again, if you have that, let's chat. Um, but I've seen enough screenshots and read enough about it and talked to friends who have it. And it's like, it's like Twitter 2.0. It's just slightly better. Um, so what I think they're, like, the bigger issue is there's so much data in motion that they can only isolate it for what, what they are infrastructurally deciding who is a power user. And that power user infrastructurally actually becomes a better power user. Actually, I guess the hidden question I have there is really more more of, you know, is Twitter eventually doomed to tear itself apart because it's yeah. triggering people's system one responses instead of the instead of uh, instead of their reasoning? Right. So I actually, I really don't have an answer to that question because as a Twitter user who's thought about quitting, but I really love the community I have on Twitter. Um, it's kind of a weird emotional negotiation that I have of like I don't know how accessible I am and I, I face harassment on a usually monthly basis for a variety of different things. And it's this weird negotiation I have of sh why am I still here? But I actually legitimately like it. And I think that that's sort of like the big issue is it's like maybe it will pull itself apart. Um, but harassment, while it affects a lot of people, it's also affecting hyper-specific groups of people. And I think a lot of the fear around it, rightly so, is, well, if it happens to one person, it could happen to you because we're infrastructurally in the same place and we're both equally open. Um, but I would... I. I guess I'm not sure. Like, I'm interested to see what happens in the next two years, next two or three years, and see, because Twitter is, is not gaining any new followers at this point. They're kind of starting to plateau. So they like, are not growing at a rate in which other social media uh, networks are growing. And that's a major issue. And some of that issue could be tied towards bad infrastructural design or really poor co code of conduct. All right, the next person at microphone four, please. Last year, my brother blocked my mom on Facebook, and she's still vocally bitter about it. I mention this because many times our online social network is almost directly mapped or closely intertwined with our offline social network. So did you look into making changes into this social network that's online? How does that affect our social network offline? As much as you may unfollow and stop talking to your boss or your former colleagues, you'll still meet them at conferences and at tea totally. parties. So how do you deal with that change of this network online, which does not actually give a clear picture of how your social network looks like, the, the, the interaction between the offline and online after that change? Um, I definitely thought about that a lot. So just in general as a researcher, I've always been really intrigued by societal norms and propriety and like what is polite behavior across uh, many different cultures. And I'm speaking as an American, but I come from a hyper-specific place in the United States. I come from Louisiana, which is the American South. But we're a hyper, hyper-specific culture. Uh, we speak two languages. It's English and then Cajun, which is an oral-based language. I only know a couple words. Um, but New Orleans, where I'm from, has the highest rate of birth retention. 75% of people that are born there stay there. So the ways in which I socialize as a, as a New Orleanian is very different in the ways I socialize as a New Yorker. Um, and that's true even, I think, when you get, like, 
even more localized if you look at Americans versus Canadians versus um, Mexicans and getting into Latin America. So I thought about that a lot, that like actually a lot of the interactions you have offline um, definitely affect and influence the interactions you have online. So a lot of advice I sort of gave people was also having to break down like how often do you interface with this person and let's think of the most neutral and polite way to like break things down. So yeah, I, I thought about that a lot. Like I, I never, I haven't yet with the people I've, I've given advice to said unfriend someone, oftentimes um, like unless the relationship has incredibly soured, that's usually the advice, but if it's in the case of a boss, for instance, my reaction is oftentimes, why don't you reach out to them if they're an old boss and say, like, I'd love to keep in touch, here's my email, but like, I'm keeping my Instagram uh, just for friends only. Okay. All right, next question from Mike number one. Um, from your project, um, I'm curious to know if you think that social breakup is actually possible or if uh, it's not really possible because people end up seeing uh, your stuff anyway. Is it bad if my response is both? <laughs> I think that uh, as social media users for a really long time we've been taught to interact with social media in a particular way um, and I don't think that that way is correct. Uh, Facebook actively wants you to post more as does Twitter and Instagram wants you to share and accumulate followers and that's the way in which these networks grow. You're creating content and that content is analytics and they package and sell that to advertisers. Um, I'm politically agnostic uh, again on that um, but I have my own personal thoughts but as a researcher that's just what they do. But I think that that push towards sharing and cross-platform sharing that you can cross-post, um, perhaps in terms of like uh, privacy is, is a horrible idea. Um, what are you saying, when are you saying it, how are you saying it are all, are all identifiers, and they're all identifiers that can pinpoint location and who you are, and who you are offline and where you are. And that's something I often do try to impart to people is um, what are you saying and when, and does it need to be said online? Um, so I. Personally, and I always give this example with people that sit with me, I'm like, I personally try to not post location, but I have a very specific reason I can't do that. And I had a lot of internal um, like dialogue of should I post that I'm at, at, at CCC? What if someone's here and they want to talk to me about something that I don't want to talk about? Um, or what if I say I'm home, like does that make my mom more of a target if someone wanted to try to swat us again? Um, and those are extreme examples, but it's also important to think about like, are you accidentally doxing yourself? You know, if you're saying, I'm at the bar downstairs from my apartment, let's check in on Foursquare and then post that on Instagram, you've pinpointed where you live. And that's information that people don't actually need. And so I always try to sort of walk this line of like, I think it's totally fine to post pictures of food and fa family and friends and, f and to do it frequently. But I think it's important to sort of know like, are you highlighting where you are? And like, are you highlighting regular patterns in your lives? And are you, then amplifying that to a variety of people that you don't know and you have no idea how many people are accessing it. All right, we have another question from the internet. I've got a question from the internet. Yesterday there was a talk titled The Possibility of an Army by Constant Dahl, who bought thousands of fake accounts. What do you think about these actions? Um, I guess I need a little bit more context. This person bought thousands of fake accounts to Actually, I don't have any context for that for you. I mean, I, so I, I um, in graduate school, uh, this woman, this fantastic ethnographer, Trisha Wang, came to speak to us. And uh, the professor, Clay Shirky, at the time was saying he bought her 50,000 followers in a day. And it was just, I think he's paid like $100. And I think it's really fascinating in which the ways that that bumps you up into a different sort of social strata and how like it made her it presented her in a completely different way online that changed the way in which people interacted with her and the amount of followers she started to accrue on a daily basis. Um, I mean, oh, I think I'm, so this person created like a thousand different accounts. I think that that's what that question may have meant. Um, from, from what I read, he bought them. He, oh, he bought them? I would be curious as to know why, like if he was looking at data or if he just bought a thousand followers. But I guess I need a little bit more information. All right. Well, the person is not here, so we don't know. We have another question from Mike number three. Hi. Um, so my sister had an occasion where um, someone who she who sort of became a stalker and um, uh, 
didn't really know her very well, but then started to send uh, really weird messages to her. And it got to a point where um, they were following her on Instagram and she can't, like, can't really control, because um, this person knows who she is and her friends. She, she couldn't control her information. And so this person would send stuff based on, oh, we bought this blender and, and would deliver it to our house along with letters about like, um, how they would have sex even though they had never really interacted before and it got really scary and unsafe and, and it's sad for that person but also it became really scary for my sister and she didn't know where to go and what to do and when she went to the police and said I'm scared that this person might might come and touch me like when I'm going home late at night what should I do they said well until something happens we really can't like do anything for you so what um, I'm there may be resources out there for, for people who are facing this, but for those watching this video, uh, what would you recommend them to do? First of all, I wanna say I'm so sorry for your sister. That's horrible. Um, and secondly, what I would suggest doing is, um, there are a variety of different uh, nonprofits that exist. Crash Override is one once you've been harassed in a really specific way. But I, what I would suggest is, um, Smart Girls Guide to Privacy has this. Uh, it's this really fantastic book, and they list um, where you can access, I think, lawyers that are more digitally savvy around digital crimes. And um, my recommendation in a case of that, with that kind of persistence, where it's a regular person, meaning a, a regular stalker, it's one entity, and they're actually starting to sort of move away from social media and moving into like letters, you should get a lawyer. And then from there, figure out ways to assign um, what's it, um, space between you and the other person across state lines even, and figure out, uh, like I, I don't know the particulars of this case, if this person is in a different state than your sister, that gets a little bit trickier. Are they in the same city? So they're in the same city. There's a lot more you can do. My recommendation would be to immediately find a lawyer who is well-versed in um, online harassment, but if that person's in the same city and they're sending letters, I think that's a pretty good reason to move, like, to start pressing charges. Like, that would, that would be my immediate reaction. All right, thank you. Another question from microphone number four. Uh, yes, thank you for your wonderful talk, first of all. Um, thank you. One thing I find myself personally very preoccupied by is not just the question of how to act on social media in the present, but also how to clean up after my past. Certainly things I've, I've uh, like written or posted before. Um, and I actually find that the uh, obstacle towards doing that is frequently infrastructural. It's really hard to sort of have an oversight of everything you've done in the past. Um, do you, what, what do you sort of see as the future of design on these platforms? Are they intentionally making it difficult or have they coded themselves into a corner and uh, is this going to become a bigger problem? I guess I would say to basing off the way the design is now, I think it's a mixture of having coded into a corner and also trying to make design minimal. So a lot of um, trends in design are around optimization and usability, but we're optimizing for speed and we're making things more usable for mobile, but we're not optimizing or designing for safety. And we're not optimizing or designing for like longevity of life within interacting within on these platforms. So I would say it's like a, a misuse of design priorities. Um, and I think that now there is some pushback with people sort of saying like, how is this being accessed? There's harassment persisting on, on this platform. How is this happening? Oh, it's happening because of these reasons, you know, et cetera. Um, I would say that it's just a, a misalignment of priorities within a design hierarchy and a coding hierarchy. All right, any other questions? Seems like we ran out of questions or we got them all cleared up for now. So thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much for coming and please give it up for Caroline again and for her awesome talk. Thank you.